Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone made a good morning. It's a beautiful day out there, that's for sure. Have a beautiful week. I think uh, spring is right around the corner. Glad to see everyone here this morning. Hope you had a good morning. Uh, as I said, Brother Mike's not going to be here this morning. I'm sure he's watching. Hey, Brother Mike. <laughs> <laughs> But we are blessed to have Brother Richard Purnell with us this morning, and he and Julie and the visitor there, and we're just glad to have you with us. And, uh, so uh, at, at this time, I guess I'll turn it over to Brother Richard and let him carry on. Come on up, Brother Richard. Well, good morning. Good, morning. good to see everybody this morning. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? Amen. That the Lord has made. First of all, it's good to be home one weekend. Amen. I've done learned the true meaning of it. there's no place like home. So you stay on the road and travel, then you learn to appreciate when you're home. This morning, if you have your Bibles with you and would like to follow along, I'm going to be in 1 John chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, we'll start in verse 7. <coughs> what do we need more than anything else when the world is in a crisis? What do we need to do more than anything else when the world is in a crisis? I want you to hold on to those two thoughts this morning as we look at 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And this, and this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. <coughs> Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. I'm going to stop right there for a minute. You know, as a child of God, we need to hold on to that. That's very understand. He first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is alive. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, 
How can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Let us pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for another opportunity that you brought us into your house that we can come and praise and worship you here this morning, Lord. Lord, we come here with humble hearts this morning, Lord. Lord, we come here with thanksgiving in our hearts, Lord. Lord, to thank you for what all you have done for us, Lord, for your hands being upon us today, taking care of us, Lord, for guidance, for protecting us, for supplying us with our needs for daily life. Lord, I thank you for each one that you sent here this morning, Lord. Lord, I pray that you open our hearts, that you open the ears to our hearts, Lord, that we may hear your word preached here this morning, Lord. Lord, I pray that you give us understanding of your word here this morning, Lord. Lord, that you give us the true meaning of your word here this morning. Lord, I pray for each one here this morning, Lord. Lord, I pray for each one that couldn't be here this morning, Lord. Lord, I pray for each one of their needs, Lord, because you know what each one needs, Lord. Lord, again, I just thank you for this time that we can gather together in your house and worship you here this morning, Lord. Lord, I just pray that in the next few moments that you have your way and your will be done here this morning, Lord. Lord, I just ask you Give us for we have failed you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Someone said long ago that there are three means of communication. A telegraph, a telephone, and tell a woman. <laughs> Some of you may think that's funny, but the majority of you in here probably don't think that's funny. <laughs> But you know, we need to tell. You know, when you learn something during the week, you want to tell somebody about it. If something good happens, you want to tell something about it. And we don't have any problems doing that, do we? <coughs> well, you know something? When you've been born again, the Spirit dwells in you. You know who Jesus Christ is. You love him. You know what he did for you. Can you tell me of a greater news than that? Why aren't we telling you? What do we need to do when a world is in a crisis? What did we read 7 through 21? What was a word in that was mentioned over and over and over? What do we need now? We need God. How do we get that love? It comes through. You know, we should be telling the good news. You know, when the Spirit came upon you, God sent His Spirit into you, you was changed, weren't you? You was there. You felt it. You began to see changes in your life. Not only did you see changes, people around you saw the changes. Things started happening in your life. Brothers and sisters, that's what we need to be telling these wonderful things that came about. We had some wonderful things. We learned that God loved us in spite of our sins. We learned that Christ died to save us. We learned that Christ died to save us. He gave his life that you may have eternal life. 
We've come to know a Savior who is more wonderful than anything else in heaven and earth. Why are we not sharing it? In the Bible, we are commanded to tell others what we have experienced. And Psalm 107, 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. The Lord's telling us that when you've had this experience, you've been born again, these wonderful things are happening in, in your life, we need to tell them. We need to share them. <coughs> the angel at the empty tomb of the resurrected Christ said, Go and tell. Jesus himself said in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He told his disciples and he's telling his people today, but listen right here. What he tells them, and he's telling you and I this morning, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. You know, he commands us to go out and tell the world, but he doesn't command you to go by yourself. He's going with you. Do you realize the power, we're going to look at it here in a minute, that when you were born again, that the power of the Spirit came into you to give you the strength and boldness to do these things? You know, every time the Lord puts something in your heart to do it, to go to speak to someone, the Spirit's already beat you there. You know, He gives us the easy part, brothers and sisters. The Spirit's already gone there to prepare the heart of the one you're going to. You know, we're not the message. All we are are the messengers. And you know, when you've been born again, you was there, you felt it. Brothers and sisters, you have a testimony right there. You can tell of the wonderful things that has happened to you, the changes that's been in you through the love of Just before his ascensions over in Acts 1, he said, this goes back to what I've been saying this morning, that when the Spirit comes upon you, this is what he told his disciples. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you. Listen right here. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, Samaria, Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You know what he's saying this morning? You ought to be my witnesses. Would you consider this Tallahassee or Kent? Well, I'm just going to say eclectic Kent, Tallahassee. We come to the surrounding areas. Wherever you go, you are to be my witness. <coughs> Do you not feel that the world today that is upside down and they searching, they looking for the truth? And you have the truth within you. You know, I saw on the TV the other day, it said the truth is essential in our lives. Get it in the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> they had part of it right. The truth is essential in our lives, but it's in this man called the Bible. He was simply saying, you know who I am, you know what I have done. Now go and tell. 
You know, years ago, there was a little book that was written by a young fellow that said, go tell the town. What he was talking about, he was engaged to be married. He had exciting news. He was proud of his fiance, and he was going to tell the news. He couldn't keep it from him. <coughs> Just like you and I, when we have good news, what are you going to do? You're going to tell it, aren't you? What's the old saying? What's in your heart going to come out of your mouth. Brothers and sisters, if you have the Spirit dwelling in you and Jesus is living in you, you need to tell the good news. Let us go tell the town and tell them of the greater love of God. The text tells us that God is love. The very embodiment of purest love. He loves us with a universal, sacrificial, and redeeming love. The Bible tells us in these words here that he has always loved us. When we were born into this world, we were born into this world with sin. We were total and depravity. We had no desire for God. We weren't seeking him. When we were rebelling against him, Jesus was loving you. You know, it's easy to love one another when someone's loving you back, isn't it? But when they disagree with you and rebel against you, it's hard, isn't it? But look at the love that God had for you. When you were rebelling against him, he loved you. He first loved you. He always will love us. He loves us not just in word, but in deed. The Bible is full of his love. Everyone knows John 3, 16. Oh, the love that he has for you and I. This morning, we're going to look at some different things about God's love. God's love is a saving love. There is nothing more wonderful in heaven and earth than God's great plan of salvation. God had a chosen group called the elect before the foundation of the world. He knew you before the world was created. Brothers and sisters, this one just a thought when you come into the world, he had plans for you before the world was laid. He had a purpose for you, just as he did for everyone in the Bible that he used. He knew that they, I don't know, lost some place. I went and got me some new glasses, went to the eye doctor this week. But I hadn't had time to go get my new glasses. I think that's the time I go on and get them. <laughs> he knew that they had sinned and must therefore pay the price of a broken law. But in his love, he wanted to save them from the penalty of sin. He gave us his only begotten son for our payment. And you know something? That payment was paid in full payment. That means that's forever and ever and ever. Jesus hung on that cross, shed his own blood, and spilled out that day that you and I may be cleansed from our sins. In John 1, 2, it says, He paid for the sins of His Paid in full. Past, present, and future. Suppose that I owed a store $50,000. And there was no way I could pay it. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the resources. But a friend of mine stopped by that one day, paid my note off, and left $10 million store credit. Brothers and sisters, he had paid my debt, he had paid my present, and he had paid my future debts. Think about it. That's what Jesus did for you.
Each one of us had a debt to pay, and we couldn't do it. <clears throat> he knew it. He had a love for you that he hung there and bled out that your debt was paid forever. Can someone in here this morning tell me of a greater love? Brothers and sisters, that's the truth and that's what needs to be told today. He said in 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his sons, cleanses from all sin. Now tell me, is there any greater love than that? After we have sinned and rebelled against God and broke his laws, that he, that God came down, reached down, forgave you, saved you, and gave you a eternal home. Is there a greater love than that? We are born in born in sin. And until we are born the second time in a spiritual birth, we do not understand. Take the time this afternoon, open your Bibles and get in John chapter 3 and read that. I heard a man on the radio the other day said, read it two or three times. It isn't how many chapters you read, it's how many verses you understand. That if you have to read it four or five times, get in there and read John chapter 3 when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. Until God sends his spirit in you and there is a spiritual divine birth within you on the inside, you do not understand. You first must be born again to have this knowledge. You know, just because you put a wheelbarrow in the garage, it don't make it an automobile. When the water in the well becomes impure, just because you paint the well pump, don't make the water clean. Till you are born again inside, till God sends his spirit within you, don't understand. You are saved by grace, Amen. not by your works. It is a spiritual divine process that comes within you. And you know, I I'm kind of drifting this one, but I hear people all the time say, well, I don't know if I'm saved. Brothers and sisters, you was there the day God sent the Spirit in you, and you know because things happened. As I said earlier, you become a new creature. Things you once hated, now you love. You are changed. Not only do you feel it with inside, people around you see it. They see a change in you because that love of God is in you and when he puts that faith within you and that love comes within you, what's going to happen? That love's going to come out of you. In all the good environment and culture in the world does not change a child into a child of God. We must be changed on the inside. We must have an experience with Christ. We must be born again. God's love is a keeping love. Some people believe in a great salvation. They believe that Christ can save by the uttermost, 
make you creatures of us, and then let us be lost and go down to eternal death. They call it in the modern world falling from grace. They are simply saying that God can save a person, but he cannot keep him saved. If we believe that, we are saying that Satan is stronger than God and can take God's children away from him. Where did this idea come from? It came from the old idea of salvation by works. There are two ideas today in this world concerning salvation. Salvation by grace or salvation by works. Now if we say Christ can save a person and then that person must do certain things to be saved, we are saying that salvation is by works. We're saying that we are saved by what we do and not by what Christ has done for you. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you this morning, if you are born again child of God, you are saved by grace. God chose you. God called you. You are saved by his amazing grace. There's nothing in us. What did Isaiah say we were? Filthy, what rags. There's no good in us. It's by the grace of God that you were saved. He saved you. God loves a sinner, but oh, he has a peculiar love for a peculiar <clears throat> He loves them so much that he will never allow them to go down into everlasting suffering. All through the Bible, he makes promises. Oh, he says, nothing can pluck you from the palm of his hands. This morning, I'm going to go over a few of them. I know sometimes I get long-winded and I'm running out of time and ain't halfway through that. This morning, you just write these verses down, and I'm going to look at them real quick. Y'all can listen fast. I'll try to read fast. And I know y'all think that's a joke, but I thought it was slow as I could. <laughs> and John, just jot these down. I'm going to read them right quick. John chapter 5, verse 24, tells us, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnations but is passed from death unto life. John 8, 51. <coughs> we read, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8, 30, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things <coughs> present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, listen right here, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 John chapter 5. 11 and 12. And this is the record that God had given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Brothers and sisters, I could go on and on with other verses. God's <laughs> love is not only a saving love, but it is a keeping love. Yes, God loves us and saves us and keeps us. 
And his keeping power is as great as his saving power. He saves us in a moment and keeps us forever. I could go on this morning with some more things, but I'm going to have to stop. I'm going to give you some things to ponder on. God's love is a providing love. God's love is a helpful love. God's love is a comforting love. God's love is a demanding love. And God's love is an eternal love. May God have the blessings on the reading of his words here this morning. Let me go back to where I started this morning. I used to have a school teacher that would do that. She would always open up a couple of questions and then at the end of the class she would remind you of those two questions. What do we need more than anything else when the world is in a crisis? What do you and I need to do more than anything else when the world's in a crisis. We need to pray and we need to go and hell. Everyone I'm sitting here this morning knows someone who's carrying a heavy burden, maybe carrying a lot of sorrow in their heart, maybe going through a time of a lot of sickness. What do they need? Someone to share some love with. Isn't it great if somebody takes the time to come by or just pick up the phone and call you and tell you I love you? It makes a lot in that day, doesn't it? You know, I often wonder who, say, who receives the more of a blessing, the one that called or the one that received it. If you stop and think about it, both of them receive a blessing. You take time to help someone, it lifts them up, and you receive just as much of a blessing as the one that you went to see. I encourage, as the young fellow that was fixing to get married said, go and tell Alice. <laughs> this morning, if the Spirit has come into you this morning, the Lord Himself opens those doors this morning. If you want to come down or someone just to pray with you this morning, I would be glad to sit down and pray with you. Thank you.